Hi, everybody, and welcome to um, the Philly Tech Week panel discussion, Fighting Bias in AI, presented by the Drexel University College of Computing and Informatics and the, the CCI Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. Um, today's panel, today's uh, discussion will be, um, again, brought to you by Drexel CCI. The panelists today are Logan Wilt. Logan is a data scientist and senior manager of DXC's DXC Technologies AI Practice, Jerry Overton. Jerry is the CEO of the Applied AI Studio. And Ed Kim, Ed is, a, is an associate professor in the computer science department at Drexel University. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn things over to, to Jerry Overton who will take things from here. Jerry? All right, thank you, David. Hi, everyone, how's it going? Let's see, I'm going to share my screen. This will be the content that you'll see throughout the presentation here. And I will, sorry, I will say real quick, if you have questions, feel free to write them in the chat. I'll moderate the chat and I'll ask questions as they come on. Uh, or uh, feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you at the appropriate time. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good point. In fact, um, for everybody who is, you know, making their way in, uh, if you could do us a favor and uh, locate your the chat window. Uh, that's going to be the primary mechanism that we use to communicate with you. We, we want to keep this interactive. So uh, you know, don't wait till the end. If you have questions, type them into the chat window. We'll strategically pause throughout the uh, presentation so that David can chime in and make sure your question is represented and make sure that the panel has a chance to comment on it. Ideally, we'd like to talk about whatever it is you wanna talk about. We're gonna take this in the direction uh, that you wanna go in. But hello everyone, welcome to um, our discussion on fighting bias in AI. First thing I wanna do is just give you a quick introduction to the panel. In fact, I'll just let the panel introduce themselves. So we'll start with you, Logan. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what it is you do? Yeah, so as David said, I'm senior manager for the AI practice, uh, DXC technology. Uh, within the practice, we work on uh, specifically, of course, AI problems for our clients. You know, many of our clients uh, exist on a spectrum in their maturity with AI, and we like to meet them wherever they happen to be and particularly work to solve problems that aren't off the shelf uh, capable of getting a solution, something that is unique to the client. Very cool. We also have Dr. Edward Kim with us. Ed, tell us a little bit about what you do. Hi everyone, I'm an associate professor at Drexel at, uh, in the Department of Computer Science. And I've been trained as a, as a computer vision scientist, uh, which is a subset of artificial intelligence and machine learning. But I would say in the past, say four or five years now, I'm, I've been moving more towards a computational neuroscientist, looking at how the, the visual system in the human brain works and trying to take some of those ideas, some of those trends in neuroscience and apply them to uh, AI and machine learning. Nice. And I'm Jerry Overton. Uh, I am working on a joint venture with uh, Drexel University and College of Computing and Informatics. We call it the Drexel Applied AI Studio. And it's, it's really cool, it's, it's an incubator. Um, but most of the time, you know, when you think of an incubator, you think of something that launches, say, uh, businesses. But this is an incubator for launching high performance artificial intelligence teams. Uh, I love it because you know, it's at the intersection of technology and leadership and such, but it's also a mechanism for driving diversity and inclusion, which is a hook into some of the things that we're talking about now. So let's go over the agenda here. Uh, before we do, I just wanna remind the audience one more time, take a look, locate the chat window. Um, and if you have questions throughout, just put it into the chat window and we make sure that we will get your questions answered or at least acknowledged uh, during the course of, of our discussion here. But here's an outline of what we'll be talking about for the next, say, 55 minutes or so. We're here to talk about how to fight bias in AI. In order to do that, we're gonna start with a basic example of what artificial intelligence is what happens when bias creeps into artificial intelligence, 
then we'll start to talk about ways of fighting bias in AI. And for us, we've broken it down to three main best practices. One, how do you fight bias in the data? Two, how do you fight bias in the machine? And three, how do you fight bias in the organization? So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, let's see. I'll ask you, Ed, to, to sort of kick us off here by answering three questions. Number one, Ed, what is artificial intelligence? Number two, what is face recognition? Number three, walk us through this case study that we're looking at here. Sure. So I would say when I characterize artificial intelligence, I would say um, it does three things. So one is at first it senses the environment. Two, then it does some sort of reasoning on the environment. And then three, it acts. So sense, reason, and then act. In the case of uh, like a, a facial recognition system, the, the computer needs to sense the environment. So in this case, it's going to be through the use of images or video through a, through a digital camera. And once the, the image comes into the system, then it's going to do some sort of reasoning. Now, so in the early days of AI, we would, for, for facial recognition, we might do something like uh, provide a template of what a face looks like and try to sweep that template across the image and find a, a good pattern match here. Um, in the days of machine learning now that's very popular what we do is we try to learn that pattern from the data okay so we're not handcrafting these these templates anymore we're trying to just show the computer lots of images of faces and have it learn that template and then we do some sort of action upon that so in this case in facial face face recognition what we're trying to do is find the face in this image and in this case you can see it's just sort of drawing a bounding box around that now, in this particular case, what we're doing, is, uh, sorry, that was face detection. In this particular case, what we're doing is face recognition. Okay, so once we've located this pattern, and this pattern is just, it's just pixels, right? These are numbers to this computer. What it's gonna do is gonna take those numbers, um, maybe call it like a vector or, or uh, you know, an array of numbers. And then we're gonna try to find a similar pattern in a database. Um, that we've collected. And really, it's just a pattern matching problem here, the face recognition. Can we, can we take this vector and then can we uh, find a similar vector in our database? And so here, uh, you can apply this type of pattern matching to various problems. And so the New York Police Department was using face recognition, now finding a pattern and trying to find a similar pattern in a database to match um, unidentified criminals in surveillance footage to and crime scene photos to those on, on different watch lists. And so um, I think we're going to go into a little bit later some of the, the issues behind it, but you can see that basically at, at the base level, what we have here is a pattern matching system. It makes sense. Now, face recognition is a fairly common application of AI, something that most of us can relate to. Uh, but that's not really the only area where AI has really become commonplace for a lot of us. Is, is it, Logan? No, it's not. So, you know, in this sense, we're definitely very much talking about cognitive AI in the sense of, you know, that vision, that sensing, that's, that's the environment, sensing the physical world. You know, a lot of common applications of AI, and, and for some people, they would define them as more like machine learning, but we are the environment that the, the AI is trying to sense. So when we see here like personalized treatment or recommendations, I think recommenders are one of the areas where people are far more often actually coming into contact uh, with AI, even if they're unaware of it. More and more systems are putting recommenders underneath underneath their, their websites and their applications to help people uh, filter through just the massive amount of data that's now available to us. Uh, and these are some of what I see as the most common applications. Recommenders certainly within the AI practice uh, were, were common, common things that clients are, were wanting to implement. Okay, so AI is becoming commonplace. 
um, many of us probably interact with some form of AI on a, on a regular basis, maybe even a daily basis. Uh, and so it has, it has an impact in, in our lives. Um, and a lot of times that can be a very positive impact when the machine and the system works the way that it's supposed to. But these systems are also, well, they're subject to bias. So let's go through this. Um, Ed, maybe you can take us through this use case here. You can describe what happens, for example, when face recognition becomes biased, what kind of problems that can that solve for people who rely on this technology? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. So this particular case here, so Joy was a uh, student at MIT's Media Lab and she had a, an assignment in this art class. And the, and the class was a mix of art and technology. And she thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if every day when I woke up, I could look in the mirror and the mirror could give me some inspiration. And so what she did was she hooked up a, like a webcam to this mirror. Uh, so it would recognize when she, her face when she came into this mirror's view. And then it might show like, I don't know, superimpose like a tiger on her face so that she could feel inspired in the morning. And what she found was that um, when she took off the shelf computer vision software that could do face recognition and she put it on the, on the mirror and she pointed at herself, it didn't recognize that there was a face present. And then, so she, she thought to herself, is it because of the illumination? Is it because of the rotate, the specific rotation of my face? Why is it not recognizing me? And so, um, you know, basically she tried all these different iterations and, and nothing would really work consistently until she took this, this white 3D printed mask and she put it on. And then all of a sudden the computer vision software worked pretty, flawlessly. And so what she found was that there is something inherently wrong with the, the computer vision systems that people are building. Wow, that's, that's kind of shocking. Is this, you say she used you know, pretty widely available software, this kind of failure, is it a corner case? Is this sort of something unusual or you see this happening quite often? Yeah, so I mean, once she found this, um, this situation in one of the off the shelf uh, software packages, she then went and did sort of an exhaustive search of a lot of the public facing computer vision software out there, such as Amazon's uh, recognition system. Um, I think there, there were a couple other um, software systems she tested, and they all seem to fail in very similar ways. And so here we see failures up to 35% in face detection. So this is just, is there a face or is there not a face, right? So this is not like recognition, which is a harder problem, face detection on darker skinned women. Um, and this was attributed here to data sets that were dominated by, they were trained on uh, primarily male and white examples. Yeah, no, okay, so that's really interesting. Um, take us through this. When you say that, um, you know, the detection algorithms failed on darker skinned women and it's attributed to uh, data sets that are dominated uh, by, uh, by male and white examples. You know, wh what does that mean? So where are these data sets coming from? What, what, what does that really matter? Give us a little color on that. So typically what we're gonna see is that these data sets are going to be created by people like us, people who are building machine learning systems, AI systems, we have an application, a particular application that we want to solve. In this case, maybe it's face uh, detection, maybe it's something else, face characteristics, emotion classification, that sort of thing. What we're doing is we're just going on, you know, websites, on databases of uh, widely available uh, faces. And so you might think, people might go to something like IMDB, for example, which is a, it's a movie database. And let's just, let's just take all the faces that we can from this database and use that as our training data. And what we don't realize is that some of these databases um, have a very strong imbalance towards uh, different types of people. Wow. Okay, so then let's talk about, we introduced artificial intelligence, gave face recognition as 
sort of a canonical example, something that people can relate to. He just talked about and this idea of bias in AI and how it can affect the way that these systems work. Let's talk a little bit about what it is that we do about this. When we encounter a situation like this, uh, you know, Ed, you just took us through uh, some of the bias in the data, which actually that's really our first line of defense is fighting bias in the data. Logan, can you walk us through, how do you do that? Yeah, so what we have here, we have kind of the, the first three steps that we go through when we talk about industrializing AI. And, uh, <clears throat> and these are the steps as we've titled them in the, the DXE Industrialized AI Starter, uh, which is one of the links that David's going to share at the end. Now, now the starter, what, what is that again? The starter is a Python package that we've put together that's basically collected in a single place uh, multiple, uh, actually other Python packages. However, these are the ones that we have found are uh, the best or the easiest to use when you're getting started uh, in AI. Uh, and there's multiple steps and no package has all the steps in industrialization. And so we've created one, we've rationalized them so they work well together. Uh, and put them in a single package so that that's the only thing uh, someone new to AI or machine learning needs to use in order to get started in working with data and, and AI. Okay, so bias can crop into AI through, say, data that's skewed, like, you know, what Ed just walked us through, pictures that mm -hmm. are skewed to a certain uh, demographic. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you've come up with a series of techniques, a series of steps here for fighting yeah that bias and then put those into a library that makes it easier for people to do. Can you walk us through what these steps are? Yeah, so of course the first one is accessing and cleaning the data. So I'll give a brief overview of that and then I'm actually gonna jump into the middle one. Um, but cleaning the raw data, data by and large is never clean. Uh, you get data from even IMDB or anything else, it can be mislabeled. If you're talking about photos, it can be incomplete. Uh, it, data almost always has to be cleaned and prepped for AI. And so the, the first, it, it's not necessarily the first thing you do, but it is, once you know what you want to do, it's the first step. But these are all very kind of recur, recursive steps here. The really the, the main one you want to jump into early on is visualizing and exploring that raw data set, looking for the missing data, looking for the features. Uh, features for us, when we say features in AI, this is basically any of those data points that you're going to use to either make, uh, to, to be predictive. So uh, in uh, the case of structured data, these are fields usually in uh, unstructured data like pictures and such, it's a little different. Um, and then you wanna plot those distributions. And that's one of the areas that's really important. So where Ed was saying that we can find data that's unbalanced, then you wanna see, you'll see that in the distributions as you plot them. So if you have an expectation that you should have an equal uh, equal balance of say men and women. So we're wanting a 50-50 and then we want an equal balance say of people of multiple uh, of races and basically the facial features that come with that so that the AI is trained appropriately. You're gonna want to plot uh, those distributions to make sure that your data, the data that you're training on actually represents the world that you want to um, predict, you know, uh, oftentimes, like I said, they can be weighted. The historical data is weighted in a, in a way that it actually isn't representative of, of today, of the modern world. Uh, and you wanna make sure you know that going in to, uh, into solving a problem. Okay, and then that gets us into this building data pipelines. With what's a pipeline? 
Yeah, so pipeline is the method, pipeline is a major method of keeping your data up to date and clean and really industrializing it for use. So in enterprise, a lot of what we see end up being um, proof of concepts that never, never make it into production. And a big problem with that is the lack of the data pipelines. Data is the lifeblood of AI. And if you haven't set up a pipeline to continuously feed that, what you have is an experiment that looks great and you can do a presentation on and people kind of get excited about, but it doesn't actually make transformative change for a company or for people. And pipelines, uh, putting those early on into your uh, process of setting up your AI is really one of the major steps that ensures that AI can actually go into, into production. I see. So once you go through the, the steps of making sure that you're removing as much bias as you can from your data, this is really about automating it to make sure that Correct. that. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Then, um, Ed, you've done some really cool work in this area. What's been your experience with um, you know, distributions and things being skewed? What's, what's your take on finding bias in the data? So I think um, in general, when we talk about uh, like splitting data, you know, predictions and that sort of thing, splitting data from, from your training and your testing data sets. Uh, the, the idea is if you train on one data set of data, it should be able to generalize to another set of data, right? So uh, the problem here is that we are always sampling the world, right? We sample data sets of uh, real world distributions and um, what we find is that the real world has very long tails at the distribution, right? Things, things that happen that you're never going to be able to put and represent in your, in your training data set. So it, imagine like the Tesla self-driving cars. Um, you can train as much as you want on, on driving, and it will get better and better on these situations that you see. But you're never, you know, may, I mean, maybe you will, but you, you might encounter a situation where there's like a piano right in the middle of the road and your, your, your car would say, well, I've never seen that in my training set because why would there be a piano in the road? Well, it just fell off the, you know, the back of this truck. And so then you run into one of these long tailed situations um, that you didn't account for. And so there's this, this problem where we're sort of training, testing on, um, samples of, of long tail distributions. I think there's also another problem here when we have, when we deploy these models, right? So we train on this distribution and we assume that our, our training uh, distribution represents the real world. But in, in, in reality, when you deploy this, sometimes there's, uh, there's um, data, data drift, right? So imagine I created something that would tell me Am I fashionable today, right? So I, I train it on, on whatever, all these images and give it a score and then I deploy it. And then 10 years later, I look at myself and say, am I fashionable today? And it's gonna say, yeah, you're fashionable but you're actually 10 years um, dated, right? So, so there's this natural sort of drift that happens in the real world that uh, they're not, it's not being accounted for when we deploy these models. Yeah, so, so the basic idea here is that, you know, if you train this machine on examples that it hasn't seen, you can't expect it to behave. Well, you can't expect it to handle those, those unexpected cases very well. And that's one of the sources of bias, I guess. But with your example of, say, the piano being you know, in the middle of the street, when you say that, you know, you have to worry about the long tail. The, thing, the interesting thing about the long tail is that you most often come up against the exceptions, which is sort of counterintuitive. What, what it's really saying is that, yeah, you know, the piano in the street is unusual, but you are usually going to encounter things that are unusual. Is that about right? It's a very, it's a very philosophical question. <laughs> I'm not sure, uh, I, I mean, that sounds, we're, we're at least going to hear a lot more about the cases that fail than the cases that uh, that go correctly. Yeah. yeah, the reason I bring that up is because it seems to me that you can just solve this problem just by collecting lots and lots of data. So why 
can you fight bias in data just by grabbing a whole bunch of it? Is that right, Logan? Well, it seems like that would be the solution. Um, but there are there, there are two areas where that can become problematic. So the first one, especially if you're trying to gather in just all of the long tail situations, that becomes impractical to, to do. You know, lots and lots of data needs lots and lots of storage, as well as I glossed over what accessing and cleaning that raw data or setting up the code to automate those pipelines. And these are singular bullet points here, but those are actually significant pieces of work in industrializing AI. And the, the, the goal here is the ability to generalize and to balance uh, the practical requirements of storage and maintaining data with a model that is useful in the real world. The other side of this is just gathering lots and lots and lots of historical data. You know, if that history has shifted from the now, that's not going to solve your modern problem. You know, Ed finds tons and tons and tons and tons of pictures of fashion and what is fashionable um, that are historical pictures, and fashion is actually a really good example of this because fashion changes very quickly. It doesn't do anything for him in right now. So just getting more pictures from, you know, even a year ago doesn't solve the problem of his AI telling him in the morning that you dressed snazzy. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't help you. So the and a big part of what our talk is here is that this is fighting bias in AI is a multi-prong um, problem and solution. You know, finding it in the data and making sure you're not introducing a bias in your data is very, very important, but it's not your only solution to fighting it. And just getting more data isn't, the, isn't actually the way that is going to solve the problem. Yeah, you know, that, okay, so that's a good segue because the thing is, tend to think of AI like this. So you have some sort of algorithm, right? And you put in data and you get out some kind of behavior. I think, you know, it's a common adage that, you know, if your data is garbage, then your results are going to be garbage. You know, you got the kind of garbage in, garbage out. And to some extent, I think the steps that you took us through, Logan, is telling us, well, if you improve here, then you can expect an improvement here. But the thing that, that, that this sort of implicitly or that it implies is that if you get this perfect, then you should be able to get this perfect. And it turns out that that's not necessarily the case because, well, you know, there's the number of factors that you just went over, Logan, but there's also a source of bias that you're not considering here is that the algorithm itself could be a source of bias, which is kind of weird because, you know, you think of the algorithm as just math, right? And if you did the math correctly, how could, how could the math be biased? But the point is a little, complicated, it's a little difficult to get your, to wrap your head around, but Ed has done a really good job of sort of breaking this down with the work that he's done. So um, Ed, I'm hoping maybe you could walk us through some of the work that you've done uh, and talk about, well, bias in the machine and, and how, how you fought it. Yeah. Um... Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna to try to do this uh, high level and very briefly here. So what, so if we, if we come back to this idea of face recognition, and again, so I'm looking at how the human brain is gonna do face recognition. What we have here is a video. This is an epileptic patient. Um, they, they have severe epilepsy. They had to have part of their skull removed and probes were put in. And it just so happens that these probes were put in, in, in a specific place in the brain called the fusiform face area. Now the fusiform face area has been known for decades, 
by neuroscientists to activate when someone sees a face. Um, and so when they, they put these probes in and, and what they did was they actually uh, stimulated a specific area in, in the brain, the, the FFA. And when they did that, this patient began to hallucinate different faces. So when they saw like a book and they, pro they stimulated this area, they saw like this sort of what they call the face fiend, a face pop up on the book. When they're looking at the experimenter and they stimulate the FFA, then the, the person's face completely changes. And so there's a couple of things that we know from neuroscience. So, so from this example, we know about face recognition in the, um, the mammalian brain, uh, in, in the human brain, as well as macaque monkeys, is that there's a specific area in the brain that's dedicated to face recognition. So there's a separate specific area. Um, there's also been studies, again, with epileptic patients. I think this was done in 2005, uh, where they put probes in, uh, in another patient's brain, um, and they showed pictures, different pictures of people and things and words and that sort of thing. And they found that there's one neuron um, that, that they were probing. It, it responded when they saw a picture of Jennifer Aniston. And so when Jennifer Aniston showed up, that neuron got really excited. Um, and it actually didn't respond to anything else. So it didn't respond to uh, any other person. It didn't respond to any other place. It just, whenever Jennifer Aniston showed up. And then, so they repeated this experiment. They saw that uh, in a different neuron in a different patient here responded very strongly when the, when the person saw Halle Berry. So they called this Halle Berry neuron. Um, and it wasn't just the face of Halle Berry, it was um, picture, uh, the words, her, just the name Halle Berry uh, written out. It was sketches of Halle Berry. It was Halle Berry as Catwoman. Um, so, so they call this the Halle Berry. So what we, what we know, one is that um, the brain has a selective area that responds to faces. Two, what we know is that the neurons within the brain are very, very selective. They, they only respond to, um, they don't respond to everything. They're actually pretty much silent a lot of the times um, and they're very selective to what they respond to. Okay, so, so that's what we know from the brain. And then if we go to um, machine learning, there's been an identified problem called the underspecification problem in machine learning. And this was uh, sort of highlighted recently by a group at, at Google. I think it was only a couple months ago where they did some tests and um, just sort of high level, what we have typically in sort of the cost landscape of uh, a, you know, a deep learning network, it would be nice if you can think of this as sort of mountains and valleys, if there was like one big deep valley. And if you placed yourself on this mountain range It'd be very easy if it's a very sort of smooth convex valley just to walk down um, and get to the get to uh, the, the bottom, sort of the global minimum. But what we see actually in deep learning is that there's um, there are lots of little valleys, and it's it's a very jaggedy mountain range. Okay, so like if you start over here on the mountain range and you start to go down, you're going to end up in this sort of local local valley, local minimum. And if you, if you start over here, you're going to end up in a different local minimum. But what the interesting thing is that both of these local minimum seem to do very well on the test set. Okay, so, um, and, and you, can, you can actually place yourself all over this cost landscape, find yourself in the local minimum, and you're doing equally well on a test set. And so what this, what this means is that, uh, so what the problem that they saw is that well, some of these local min minimums, they do well on this test set, but they have specific issues. Like this, this local minimum has problems when it comes to the color distribution. So if the color is a little bit off, it'll do poorly. This one does well on color distribution, but it does poorly on noise distribution. And the problem is you, you don't know that because they're all doing equally well on the test set. So just learning the parameters of the system from the data, which is what a lot of machine learning is doing these days seems to have its own problems. And so what we, what we built here is a system that tries to build specification into the model, the architecture itself. And so for example, uh, this model, what we did, we, we partitioned out the face 
detection pathway, right? We said you have your own specific pathway region. And not only that, you're extremely selective and you, you actually compete here for the representation of the face. And I think we see we can all sort of relate to this, uh, at least with, you know, we're all we're all human, right? So when we we see faces everywhere. We see faces in, you know, when in a car headlights, uh, we see faces in in toast that we, you know, toast patterns. Um, and so that is that is the idea behind the human recognition system. It's a very strong selective um, area in your brain that that's competing for for representations. And so we built that into a machine learning model. And what we found was these these deep learning models, state of the art, they're getting they're getting a face detection wrong 35 percent of the time on imbalanced data sets. Uh, when we build specification into the model, we're seeing perfect accuracy, nearly perfect, 99 point like 99 percent accuracy on face detection um, when you build specification into the model. So hopefully I didn't take too long. Yeah, yeah, well, so this idea of under specification, then let, let's try and, I don't know, clarify what this means. Because what I'm hearing you say is, even if you got the data right, and you built a model that pulled as much inference as it could from the data, that in itself is not necessarily enough to ensure that you have a model that acts in a way that's unbiased. Is that, is that right? Is that basically the heart of under specification? I think, I think so. I think the, so the problem is that there is, there's an immense amount of structure that is innate to the world, right? There's, there's structure in our visual system. Uh, we're not looking, when we look around, we hardly ever see white noise patterns, white noise patterns, like, you know, on the old school TVs, when you went to a channel that didn't exist and it had this sort of fuzzy white noise. So we don't, we don't see that kind of randomness. We see structure, we see edges, we see faces, we see objects and that sort of thing. And so that, that structure um, is when we, when we say to the model, Hey, here's the data, go learn parameters. We're actually, we're just ignoring all of the structure that already exists out there. And so this, I think with the under specification and, this, and put building specification into the system, we need to, we need to make decisions. We need to leverage some of the structure that exists um, in order to improve these models. So then you, you can't rely solely on the data to make a good unbiased model. You have to put structure into the model itself. This structure, it sounds like it's, it's a human endeavor. Like this requires the judgment of the team building the model. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And not only do you have to um, add structure to these models, but you also have to look at the objective uh, of these models. And so typically what we have um, in a lot of these models is a single objective function. And the objective is, you know, maximize or minimize some cost. And what does that cost? Usually that cost is, is actual money, right? Costs, um, financial cost. And so when we, app, when we narrowly optimize a single objective, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're sacrificing other objectives that might be important uh, to, to sort of maximize one. So that, that's really interesting because that gets us to the third area that we want to cover in fighting bias in AI, because what that suggests is um, if these models require structure, that structure is done by the team working on building these models, then it matters who you have in the room. Um, it's not just a data problem. It's not just a math problem. This is also a human problem. Fighting bias in AI is also about fighting bias in the teams and the organization um, that you use to create, launch, maintain the AI, uh, which then gets us to what does it really mean to fight bias in the organization? This is where I, I'm really happy to be able to talk at least a little bit about what we're doing with Drexel University and the applied AI studio. Like I mentioned at the very beginning, it's an incubator for 
building high performing AI teams. What is very cool about this program is that we build it from uh, the employees that our companies already have. Um, and so in that sense, you can use it to custom design the teams that you want. You can use it to drive the kind of diversity that you're going to need. If you want to build a model that has the structure uh, in it that you know, takes into account, say, cultural diversity, it makes sense to have a team that is also culturally diverse through this process of developing talent, working hands-on to launch real AI with the kind of experience that we've been talking about, and then transitioning that, you know, managing how that group is transitioned into the organization, basically creating the incubator for it. This becomes a way of building a team where you have the people in the room who are going to, to give you the best chance of building those kinds of structures. I'm wondering, Logan, um, if you've had experience with it really mattering, it, it really being of consequence, who happens to be in the room at the time? Oh, well, yeah, it absolutely matters who's in the room at the time. So, you know, when you're, when you're building AI and you're building, you know, models, uh, especially for models that are going to have an impact on a direct impact on people and people's lives, then um, the team that you select to build those models are who are gonna be aware of the modern world that we're building the models for. So I've, I've mentioned this before that, you know, the data can sometimes be reflective of the history and you need a person who can basically interpret and translate that history for what we actually want to achieve in, um, in a current situation. Uh, makes me think of, we had, we had a situation where we were wanting to use, uh, it, it was within a talent uh, development project. Mm -hmm. And we uh, wanted to use you know, resumes in order to start to predict how those resumes look coming in for good hires. Now, and this has been a problem in multiple situations where like Ed was saying, you end up opt optimizing on the wrong thing. Uh, so you were, so I, Google has a, um, you know, represented problem with this where they tried to do this and it was overly weighted towards, you know, white men or men at least in general. Um, but what they optimized for in using their historical data is who got hired, not who was a good hire. And having the right people in the room, and in this case, we were working with the talent and development team, not necessarily the recruiting team. So the workforce management talent development team was saying, well, the resume, the resume is an indicator, um, but we want to actually combine that data with the actual the performance, how the person actually did, because a really snazzy resume uh, actually might not be the good indicator of a really good long-term hire. And so, you know, having, having the people who were wanting to solve the problem and having people who were really already very cognizant of diversity and inclusion, because this was a team that wanted to ensure that we had good representation across the organization, really, really made a difference in crafting uh, essentially the outcomes, the correct outcomes that we wanted to optimize for, as opposed to uh, using a proxy and accidentally optimizing for the wrong thing. Very cool. Yeah, that's that's a pretty vivid and relatable example of you know, it, it mattering the team that you end up building. You know, I, I'd like to do a recap of the ground that we've covered so far. But before I do that, let me check in with David. See, David, is, are there any questions that we need to address? Yeah, a couple questions have come in. Um, one, this is for Ed. Does the specification that you mentioned lead to overfitting? Uh. Well, it, I think 
they, I think the, the problem is um, of overfitting is slightly different in that, okay, so specification, um, it's going to help um, define the problem a little bit a little bit better, a little bit stronger in in certain cases. Like for example, one one of the one of the most successful um, uh, implementations of specification, I think, was a was a convolutional element within the neural network. So before the the neural networks would be treating each of the pixels of an image independently, um, and and it, it wouldn't sort of build it wouldn't uh, capture relationships uh, between pixels that are that are next to each other, right? So, which doesn't make any sense because a pixel right next to another pixel is going to be highly correlated, right? So, so the specification is going to say, all right, we know that the structure exists. Let's capture that within a feature. Um, that being said, uh, you can you can then still overfit on overspecified uh, data, right? So we can sort of we can build this specification into the system and then overtrain the system, and we're still going to run into the overfitting problem. So I think there's maybe there's uh, multiple issues at um, uh, at play with with uh, overfitting. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that. Kind I, of I think one of the key things here is also the scope of generalization. So one of the things in your study that I don't think you brought up here is, hopefully I remember this correctly, so correct me if I don't. But one of the things you did is you intentionally then turned around and trained your model on biased data, correct? Like a generally white, I think male, like what we see in uh, open source systems pictures and then applied it to people with darker skin tone and more women, and it still recognized, it still identified those faces. So in your case, the specification was focusing in on generalization. And the problem with overfitting is that you lose your ability to generalize when you uh, tune your model or your algorithm too much to a specific data set. So I think that's, that's something I wanted to mention. Yeah. He's cool. nodding in agreement, so I got it right. <laughs> David, um, any, any other questions? Yes. Um, edge cases, tails are harder to generalize in many instances. For impact of bias in the middle, would comparing representation of the features in training set to features in known population help identify problems that need to be addressed? Well, let me chime in on this one. Uh, I think the most important thing is to look at the features themselves, right? So this leads to the you know, taking care of the underspecification problem where it's basically looking at the features. If you're, for example, predicting whether or not someone is credit worthy, right? you wanna look at their social media behavior. Um, you know, you can look at the, the long tail, you can look at, you know, what is, aberrant social media behavior. But I think even more fundamentally is, do you want that feature at all, right? Do, do you want to issue a credit score based on, I don't know, how someone tweets? Um, so I, I think a more fundamental thing here is, you know, looking at the features themselves. But that, that's my perspective. Uh, Logan, Ed, you guys have a different, different take on it? Let me... I'm going to read the question. <laughs> so maybe, um, so yeah, I'm also having a little bit of trouble here, but I think when we look at the representation of the features in the training set and then the general population, I think the, again, sort of the goal is to hack. So you, you, kind of always in general want to be training on this the same distribution that you're testing on. And so if you see disparity between the training distribution and what you plan to deploy it, where you de um, plan to deploy it, I think 
you know, that that's going to definitely tell you that there's some sort of problem here. Yeah, I, I think that's also, if I understand the question correctly, it's also the problem of us sampling our data and choosing things as proxies for problems. So, you know, when you're comparing features in your training data to features in the real world, to kind of going back to my talent uh, uh, example, where I think one of the problems that we see is if we're trying to just use resumes for hires, um, whether or not they're a good hire, uh, that's an incomplete data set. We actually don't have enough features available. That's, it's not enough features for what is the real world problem. So in that sense, it has a lot to do, I think, with your team. So when you're trying to make sure that you can have your edge cases or your long tails um, accounted for while still fighting bias in the middle, it's really a matter of having the people in the room to make sure that you are crafting the model for the correct problem and you have that breadth of features available in your data set. We do this a lot where we actually end up combining data sets from multiple sources in order to uh, build our models because no one data set actually has enough features to approximate the real world. It's kind of like your piano in the middle of the road. We have a data set in our head that says, that's a piano. We also have a data set in our head that says that should not be in the middle of the road. Um, it actually doesn't matter to a certain extent whether or not we're able to identify piano in that moment. It's more, don't hit that, but we don't get hung up on it. Um, I had a situation one time, so I live in a fairly rural area and I was driving dark country roads one night. I come around a corner and we have a lot of black Angus uh, cattle. There was a cow in the middle of the road, big cow. And I, I had to swerve off the road to not hit it. You know, honestly, I don't know if I identified it was a cow in the right moment, but a car, you know, being able to see that and make that generalization that there's a thing in the road, you know, that edge, I don't know if we need to tell it that it has to identify a cow, but that edge case is it needs to react when there's an object that it shouldn't, you know, be driving through. Cool, interesting stuff. David, more questions? Questions, what areas, products and services should AI just not have a hand in, at least for now? Does AI have a place in our legal system, welfare system, et cetera? Or is it still too naive to, too naive before we build AI systems in these and other areas? Oh, wow. Okay, that's a killer yeah. question. Um, okay, so this is a, a matter of speculation going out on a limb. Well, let me see. Ed, Logan, you guys want to take this first? I, I have an opinion on it, but you guys want to jump in on that? I can, I'll jump in here. Um, so I think this is a, this is a loaded question here. And I'm going to say that um, I think the, the problem is not necessarily AI um, in and of itself. So I, so there's, I think the problem with AI currently is, again, it's sort of confounded with a different problem in AI. And that's the, the, the nature of, um, it's, it's sort of known now as deep learning is just a black box, right? Something comes in and something comes out and you're not really sure why it happened, right? And so you can look at the parameters of the system. You can try to figure out, you know, what, what's this nonlinearity doing in this combination. But um, if we're gonna deploy something like that, then we have a problem. Uh, if, however, we can deploy something and it can explain itself. So this comes to explainable AI. If it can say, uh, so there was this, there was a pretty famous case of uh, this compass system where it was trying to predict recidivism, um, where they uh, they just showed it pictures of people and their statistics, and they said, you know, what is the likelihood that this person is going to commit a crime in the future? And the problem was it was completely black box, right? You put this, the thing in and it would make a decision for you. And, um, and then you just, you know, base whatever legal procedure on that, on that system without really understanding what it's doing. But if we knew what it was doing, 
uh, it could explain itself. It said, you know, I'm, I'm doing this because of the race of the person. Then you can say, oh, well, that's completely bogus. We're not going to, we're not going to trust you for this. And so if it can explain itself and explain itself reasonably to a human who is then making the decision, I think it's okay to deploy these systems um, in, in these situations, as long as the, you know, there's a human in the loop here. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with that to a certain extent. My, my comment would have been something like, I don't think that there's a particular area where we shouldn't apply AI. I think there's a code of conduct that should be followed anytime AI is applied. What that code of conduct is, I'm not exactly sure. I know that it entails things like what you just brought up, Ed, with um, you know, just checking it, looking it over to see if something looks, quote, bogus. I think that should be a common part of you know, applying AI. Um, again, not sure if there's any particular area that I just think, oh, this is just not applicable. I think it's more of you know, the ethics and the standard practices that you use for, for applying this stuff. Logan, what do you think? So I, I agree with that, that it, it has a far more to do with the people and the ethics behind the organization that are implementing these. And it's not about the domain. It's also like Ed and what you're saying, like the black boxes and things. It's also not about the quick, the quick wins in AI, uh, selling on the you know, the sexy automation. And a lot of these AI systems, they're being put in place with the intent of automating people out of the loop. And that's where I think a lot of the problems come in. They're not being built to augment the people in the loop. So Ed, where you were saying, having that human in the loop, having the AI be that augmentation to them, as opposed to an automation of them, I think is really important, especially in, in some of these situations where you, you just cannot have a black box or you, you need to have a human to understand and make a judgment that, you know, that was, that was a terrible choice that AI made. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it totally, totally makes sense. Human in the loop, um, which may be one of the code of conduct standards that needs to be adopted for implementing AI quite possibly. Well, this has been a really interesting conversation. We've been talking about fighting bias in AI, we've covered fighting bias in the data, in the machine, and in the organization. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. I do want to thank the panelists here. Uh, Logan Wilt, thank you so much for, for joining us, for discussing it with us. Ed? Glad to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Ed. Really interesting stuff that you're doing. Glad that you were able to share it. Thanks, Jerry, too. See you, too. Uh, for the closing remarks, we'll turn it over to David uh, to talk about, you know, what happens after this, information that can get shared, where you can find the recording and uh, things like that. David? Thanks, Jerry. Um, so I'm putting up on the screen now, I'm putting up some information about today's talk, emails and links. Um, so Ed, Jerry, and Logan's email addresses, um, a link to one of Ed's papers, the selectivity and competi uh, competition of the mind's eye and visual perception. And Logan talked about the AI starter earlier. Here's the link to that. I'll also put them down into the chat right now in case you want to copy and paste it. Um, I'm actually moving stuff around. I don't know why it's moving around. There we go. Yeah, and just a quick thing. My email is lwilt2. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Sorry. Yeah. I left the L out. So lwilt. Um, so I'll put all this into the, the chat right now. Um, and also, um, as you saw, this session is being recorded. So I will be putting, um, we'll be um, putting everything into the chat now. Um, I will be uh, processing the recording this afternoon and I will be emailing out the link to the recording as well as the links to the emails and the, and, um, the papers um, probably first thing tomorrow. So anybody who's registered through Eventbrite who um, has attended today, I will be emailing that out. If you have any questions, feel free to write me back and I can put you in touch with uh, Logan, Ed, or Jerry or write them directly on the emails uh, listed below. Um, again, I wanna thank everybody for attending this week, this Philly Tech, uh, Tech Talk Week, hosted by the Drexel College of Computing Informatics and the Drexel CCI Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee. And with that, um, 
when I wrap wrap everything up. Thanks to the panelists, and hope everyone has a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.